Today's <clears throat> gospel, as we've just heard, directs our attention towards Christ's transfiguration. It's a crucial moment in the gospel of St. Luke. A few verses earlier, our Lord had revealed that he must suffer, die, and be raised from the dead. Moreover, that his followers also had to be prepared to take up their cross and follow him. Now, immediately after those verses, St. Luke presents Jesus taking Peter, Paul, and James, and John, Peter, James, and John, up a mountain to pray. Given the care with which Luke normally positions and orders his account of Christ, we can expect, therefore, that what comes next will reinforce and explain what has already been alluded to, and we're not disappointed in that expectation. If we take the transfiguration itself, what happened is that our Lord revealed himself in all his glory. The appearance of his countenance changing as well as his clothes becoming dazzling, was a consequence of the glory of Christ's divinity overflowing from his soul into the rest of his body. The experience recalls the dazzling brilliance of Moses' face after his encounter with God on Mount Sinai. Yet for all the similarity, there's one crucial difference. Moses' face dazzled because he encountered something other than himself, that is, God. Christ dazzled, however, just in virtue of himself. Indeed, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that Peter, James, and John would not have realized this, given that at the moment of the transfiguration, at the moment for Jesus first revealed himself, no one else was present. Once the transfiguration had begun, however, Christ engaged in conversation with Moses and Elijah, who had subsequently appeared. Their presence was highly suggestive. Moses represented the law and Elijah the prophets. In a nutshell, canonical scripture as it was at the time of Christ. What Christ does then, his mission, will be consistent with what God has done previously in salvation history. Indeed, Christ's mission will perfect and fulfill those earlier divine actions. The way he does this, however, will not be easy. The crucial point in our Lord's discussion with Moses and Elijah was that Christ will depart or pass in Jerusalem, that Christ would undergo his own exodus. Let's be clear about this. Christ, the one who is dazzling in virtue of himself, that one is God, and that one will undertake his own exodus and do so for our sakes. Moreover, if that wasn't enough, the next thing to happen was a revelation of the Trinity. St. Peter had somewhat missed the point and decided it would be good if they all stayed on the mountain. It's not such a bad idea considered in itself, I suppose, but it would have had a disastrous effect on our salvation. After all, if Christ had stayed on the mountain, he wouldn't have gone to Jerusalem for his exodus, and therefore we wouldn't have been saved through it. Instead, God the Father intervenes, confirming Christ as his choice, confirming Christ's choice, and acknowledging him as his Son. Whilst the Holy Spirit was present as the cloud which engulfed them all. So the point that's continually being rammed home here in this gospel is that God the Son himself will bring about our salvation through his death on the cross. 
that event is consistent with God's earlier saving actions, and indeed it perfects all of them. Moreover, it is what God wanted to happen. And that's worth reflecting on, because if God could do this for us, if God wanted to do this for us, then surely in the light of that, we too can manage a little penance ourselves during Lent.